Uh, today we're talking about Chapter 11, um, Moral Development. This is an interesting, I, I really enjoyed this chapter on, on moral development. Um, but anyway, let's get right into it, all right? Morality as a definition involves knowing the difference between what is right and wrong and acting on that knowledge. Um, it turns out that morality has an emotional component. It has a cognitive component. Um, you know, there's a guilt and a shame that we're going to refer to in the emotional side. It's got a cognitive component, knowing right from wrong. But uh, perhaps most important um, is the behavioral component, the actual act of doing right and wrong. Okay? So we're going to get to that morality thing. Okay? This is really interesting. Uh, originally, it was moral, moral development was studied by um, Lawrence Kohlberg, and it, uh, this guy is real famous on this. Uh, moral reasoning refers to the way that people think about right and wrong and the cognitive component of morality. Um, Kohlberg believed, he was, he, he was a firm, uh, big follower of Piaget, and he believed that the development of morality is something which is sort of hardwired inside of a child. That is to say that... Um, Similar to Piaget, you know, with Piaget, he, Piaget refers to this, um, this requirement that you have experiences, but the stages of cognitive development are invariant, right? All children go through pre-operational, opera, I don't remember what they all are, goes through them, and of course you need experiences to sort of trigger that movement, right? But that movement is preordained. A child is going to go, as long as a kid has the right experiences. It's the same kind of a thing. As long as a child has a proper experience, she's going to go through stages. Okay? So now, Piaget studied children in moral development. Uh, not Piaget, uh, Colbert. And uh, he gave a bunch of stories. This is a, the very famous one. He gave a bunch of stories and asked kids, what should they do? And um, he wasn't interested necessarily in their um, responses, yes or no, or something like that. He was really res interested in, oh, why should they do that? And the responses the kids gave. According to Kohlberg, the responses the children gave to these moral dilemmas was a strong indicator of what level they were at in their moral development. So let's read this first this story. This, he, he had many, but this is the one that is by far the most famous. A woman was near death from a special kind of cancer. There was one drug that the doctor thought might save her. It was a form of radium that a druggist in the same town had recently discovered. The drug was expensive to make, but the druggist was charging ten times what the drug cost him to produce. He paid $200 for the radium and charged $2,000 for a small dose of the drug. The sick woman's husband, Heinz, wanted everyone he knew to borrow the money, but he could only get together about $1,000, which is half what it cost. He told the druggist that his wife was dying and asked him to sell it cheaper or let him pay later, but the druggist said, no, I discovered the drug and I'm going to make money from it. So Heinz got desperate and broke into the man's store to steal the drug for his wife. Should Heinz have broken into the laboratory to steal the drug for his wife? Why or why not? And so again, Kohlberg wasn't interested in yes or no, he was interested in why. And so, you know, common, common responses, no, stealing is always wrong, or yes, because the needs outweigh the, you know, the costs outweigh the benefits, or the benefits outweigh the costs in this case. And so he looked at these kinds of stories to, to, and, and found that, uh, or, or decided that moral reasoning requires, well, maybe I should have put this slide first, whatever. Not only does moral reasoning require cognitive development, but it also requires perspective taking. Perspective taking is just another word. I don't know how. I mean, just think about it. Just like uh, again, that um, uh, theory of mind, that ability to understand the world from another person's perspective, to be able to put yourself in their shoes. Piaget's Three Mountains Task. The ability to understand the psychological perspective, motives, and needs of others. Central to the development of moral reasoning, empathy, pro-social reasoning, altruism, and aggression. We're going to talk about all of these things in this chapter. If you cannot take the perspective of another person, you will never ever be, you, you know, demonstrate moral thinking. You will never be empathetic to them. You will never, uh, you know, be altruistic to them. You'll be, I mean, etc. Okay? It's not enough, of course, but it's, it's something. But we also need experience. Okay? Um, is this what I already just said? I summarized it. 
whatever. I forgot what was on the slides. Experience is necessary. We have to feel a degree of cognitive disequilibrium before we move on to more complex moral reasoning. Um, and the children move through these levels of moral reasoning that I'm going to describe, three, three main levels with two stages each. Um, and as I had already hinted, universal and invariant, all children move through in the same order. However, um, as it says, experience is required. So some people, um, though there are these three levels with th two stages, six stages, uh, by far not all children make it to the top. Not at that, that, that's just not true. You need experience to, to move you along. But if you do move along, if experience says, hey, it's time to move, you will always go through the same order. Okay, let's take a look at. at uh, okay, oh, it's down here. Kohlberg proposes some levels will be universal, where others will depend on social conditions, right? We said that stage six is very rare, perhaps it's theoretical, maybe nobody ever gets to stage six. Um, and some people believe that there might be a stage seven or something that transcends uh, traditional moral reasoning and goes to the existential or perhaps religious level. Well, here is, here's the levels that he proposed, anyway, the original levels. At, the pre-conventional level, the conventional level, and the post-conventional level. In fact, you know what? I'll leave this up to you to read, and I want to show you on this next slide uh, some examples. The pre-conventional level is um, before the conventional level. Makes sense. Um, at the beginning, um, stage one is called the punishment obedience orientation. And here's a, here's a good idea to, to get this across. I do not say bad words, because if I do, my mommy will get mad at me. So in other words, moral behavior is defined by the pain involved. Step two is not terribly much different personal reward orientation. I will pick up my toys if you give me a cookie. In other words, moral behavior is defined by its consequences. Behavior is defined by its consequences. What a shock, okay? And so if the consequences are bad, then it's a bad behavior. If the consequences are good, then it's a good behavior. And so, you know, th this goes back, of course, to Thorndike's law of effect, which simply says, you know, behaviors that are followed by a satisfying state of affairs become more likely to occur, whatever, whatever it is, okay? But you get the idea. And it's the same thing, except it's more than just the act of behaving, but the act of defining what is acceptable moral behavior comes simply from the direct consequences to myself. In the conventional level, the children, again, now, moral development is intimately linked to cognitive development. We said it, but it's also intimately linked to social development. Because at the first stage uh, of moral thinking, it's all about what happens to me. And now, finally, they're, um, the kids are starting to think about others. Okay, The first evidence of taking another's perspective right here. In the third stage, the good boy, nice girl orientation, I do not eat in class because my teacher does not like it. So whoever, some significant other has some ability to, but again, this is, um, this is very little different from reward orientation because uh, my teacher will disapprove of it, it will feel bad to me, okay? And so again, it's the consequences to me, but it, it does incorporate another human being into it. The law and order orientation. I do not talk during the fire drill because that is one of the rules, okay? And so you start to get a respect not just for how other people feel, but you get to start to get respect or understand that your behavior has consequences to other people and you don't feel good if the consequences to somebody else is bad. In stage five, the social contract orientation. I pay taxes because it's the law and the law protects us all. And so now again, we're starting to understand that our behavior affects other people. That um, not just it's a rule, which is sort of like blind obedience, but instead an understanding of the rule. Okay? And at stage six, which again, as I said, even uh, Kohlberg himself, many critics as well, but Kohlberg himself even said this may not really exist, and most definitely most people do not get here. Okay? And in this one is the universal ethical principle orientation. I admit guilt right here, I admit it. I pay taxes not because it is a law, but because it is the right thing to do. And it's like, hell no. I pay taxes because I'm afraid of the IRS. I guess that's stage two. 
Yeah, I'm at stage two, buddy. Ha! Be dead. Oh. So there's all of the words again. So here's an interesting one. This was um, here's a good here's a good lesson in in uh, moral reasoning. Okay, my daughter at this point was seven and a half years old, and uh, I had recently gotten a new desk. Okay, it was a nice. I liked it. It was a it was a very nice. Uh, I got this really big desk in my uh, home office, and uh, one day I go up to my new desk and I find there's huge X just gouged into the surface right smack center of right where you're sitting. There was a couple of lines on there. There was a smaller X, but this big X down there just gouged right in. And I'm like, this is my new desk. Welcome to fatherhood, dude. All right. So um, subsequently, by the way, I've Flip the desk around so that you can at least put something on the back to hide that. But man, I mean, seriously, every time you just rub your hand, you move, and it was so. I was, I was kind of pissed. All right. So now, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this girl think about this a little bit. So I forced her. I said, "That's it. Go write me an essay." All right. So she wrote me an essay, and in fact, she put this essay on nice scrapbook paper. She made it up real nice. That part was her own. I just said, "Go write this up." You talk about why that was wrong. Go. So here's what she wrote. Property. You should respect people's property because it's theirs, not yours. If you do not respect people's property, you will get a punishment. Hey, that's stage one. If you are a child and you don't respect your parents' property, your punishment would probably be writing an essay <laughs> or reading a book or doing a chore like washing the dishes or washing the car. Or even bigger punishment like getting grounded or no dinner or no lunch or no breakfast or no food or water for a full day. All right, so now this is where she stopped. She brought it downstairs, showed it to me. And I was like, okay, this is all stage one moral reasoning at this point, okay? That was totally her. Then I talked to her about it. I talked about why it was wrong, um, what we could do, you know, things like this. And so here, I said, go back upstairs. I want you to, you know, write some more on this essay. So after we talked about it, here's what she added at the bottom, okay? It's not, it's still not stage six moral reasoning, but all right, we up the stages here. Also, some more reasons why you should respect other people's property. If you are a grown up and you do not respect other, pe other people's property, you might go to jail. That's still stage one, isn't it? It also hurts other people's feelings. Stage three reasoning. Gotcha. Okay. How would you feel if someone came into your room, asked you what your favorite thing was in the room, took that, and broke, splashed, smashed it? You would probably feel really, really sad and angry. I am very sorry about what I did. So clearly after we talked about it, her moral reasoning did bump up from one to at least three, if maybe four. It's hard to... Hard to get it all out of there, but from one to at least three. So clearly this moral development requires experience, okay? That's the experience I right? I don't know, but now I got a desk with a great big X carved into it. All right. So now some people went along and they studied Colbert quite immensely, and they found, okay, you know what? First off, it's kind of silly to say, this kid is at stage one, this kid is at stage two. So what they did was they found that um, they took kids and they, like I said, they gave them, or adults too, and they gave them the, the Heinz story or something and then these other ones, and they go, why, okay, and then they assessed a level of, of moral reasoning, and, and here's what they basically found. Let's, let's pick a 10-year-old to start here. It turns out a 10-year-old never exhibits stage four reasoning, never, not even once. Ten-year-olds occasionally demonstrate stage three moral reasoning. Ten-year-olds okay, sometimes demonstrate stage one, but for a ten-year-old, the most common moral reasoning is stage two. Look to a twenty-year-old. Twenty-year-olds are beginning to demonstrate stage five reasoning, but not very often. A 20-year-old's most common level of uh, moral reasoning is at stage three, with stage four mixed in, some stage 
two still. Stage one, moral reasoning has now disappeared for these 20 year olds. And so we can go along and we find that as people get older, the most common types of moral reasoning get higher stages. But even a 36 year old, though the most common moral reasoning they, do, they, they exhibit is stage four, they still definitely do these other things. They still reason at these other ways in other situations. Okay? So moral reasoning is somewhat situation specific. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of criticisms about the universal nature of it because um, they went to some pre-literate societies, I want to say these uh, tribes in the Amazon, and they found zero people ever uh, giving, I want to say stage four, even stage three was incredibly rare, and stage four, none. Zero people in this entire village demonstrated stage four moral reasoning. A very few demonstrated stage three, by far the majority demonstrated one and two. And these were the grown-ups, okay, not just the kids. And so um, it's like, okay, so you're saying that uncivilized people are morally inferior? Is that what you're saying, you know? So something is funky here. Something is not right. Even in rural cultures, we find this. I mean, rural within rural America, okay? And so um, we find that this may or may not be a true thing. So um, there was a, a different, uh, who, whose was this, the CAD model, the, um, oh, I forgot, was this, this wasn't Mark, I don't remember whose model this was, whatever. Here's a, an alternative model to moral reasoning that attempts to be more universal, and this is, this is pretty good. This, this model, the CAD model, argues that there are three, um, three different types of moral reasoning, okay? Kohlberg, unfortunately, was only focusing on one. He focused solely on the ethic of autonomy. I'll describe what these are. Kohlberg only focused on the ethic of autonomy and hence violations of justice. But, but uh, what happens is that around the world, other people look at other types of moral reasoning that we in America might not perhaps find to be the most prevalent. So here, in fact, better, even better to show you is this next image. This is a great one. Here is the ethic of autonomy, and this is the one, as I said, in Western moral reasoning, this autonomy is by far the most important way to think about morality, okay? Autonomy violation. Someone is edging ahead of you in line, and so you feel anger, okay? And so the idea is that here in America, this type of autonomy violation is something that we find to be just flat wrong. How about this? Community violations. Someone doesn't go to his own mother's funeral, so you feel contempt. Okay? But here's the drill. Here in America, we have laws against autonomy violations. We do. We set laws about them. We don't set laws about community violations like this, okay? We might go, what is wrong with you, dude? But you know what? There's no law if you want to break a community violation. Ditto on divinity violations. A 70-year-old male has sex with, well, okay, that one might be illegal because she's 17, but a 70-year-old male has sex with a 17-year-old female, and so we feel disgust, all right? These emotions are connected to these different types of, and so we lump together moral reasoning, but in fact, and, and, and as we said, morality has cognitive components, emotional components, and these are the different emotions that are associated with morality, anger, contempt, and disgust depending on the type of moral violation. But as a general rule, we do not have laws in our country about these because of this. And this is how Kohlberg defined it, it was this type. But other cultures clearly, clearly use divinity and community violations to be far more important. See, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, take a side trip because this is this is bigger this is bigger than you know bigger than just this. Um here in America, we have this moral superiority. <laughs> Admit it, we do, okay? As a country, we have this moral superiority, and we run around telling these countries, let's just pick China because they're the, they're, they're the, the bad guy of the day, and we talk about human rights abuses, and we talk about, you took away her freedom or something like this, or we, you know, they locked up some activist or some shit like this, okay? And we say, oh my God, that's so terrible because that's an autonomy violation. You're taking away that person's individual liberties or something like that. However, in other cultures around the world, they don't think like that, okay? 
they instead perhaps have a community, an ethic of community being the primary way that their culture thinks about morality. And say in, in uh, non-Western Chinese culture, the, the harmonious functioning of society is far more important than any one individual, okay? The, the group is more important than the individual. And so we find that they do not view, they say this, if that one individual is disrupting our community, then that one individual's human rights, as we define it in the West, who gives a shit, okay? We don't have human rights. And so what's happening is that it's kind of silly. Here we have this moral superiority and we're like, you have human rights abuses, and this country is like, are you shitting me? We're taking care of our community, okay? If one individual is disruptive, why should I be so sweet and gentle to that one person when that one person is messing with a hundred? I mean, and there's some logic to that, right? And so we take this personal li uh, personal freedom, personal stuff, very expe uh, very very heavily. And so we find that um, Kohlberg's moral reasoning focusing on here does not translate well to other people's countries. Their definition of what is morally correct, their definition of, and it's just so silly that we just get up on the, 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 the world stage and just, just start screaming about human rights abuses when that's not how they think. They don't think that way. And so they look at us and they just, and you can see why they start to resent us. Uh, okay, so now guilt and empathy, some of the emotions. Rather than focusing on reasoning and moral development, some theorists have chosen to examine the role of emotions in morality, including both negative emotions, such as guilt, and positive ones, such as empathy. A conscience, we have seen a conscience before when we talked about a superego. A sense of right and wrong which forms when children learn to understand and regulate their emotions. Oh, regulating emotions. We did self-regulation in the last chapter. Children internalize rules and begin to feel guilt about their bad behavior and empathy for other children who have been wronged. Okay, that makes sense. But, uh, okay. Guilt is... Blah, blah, blah. Shame is... Blah, blah, blah. Blah. No, thank you. Empathy, the ability to understand another person's emotions and feel the same or similar emotion. Uh, clearly, it requires perspective taking, it, it requires cognitive development, it requires social development, and it is a, a, a huge important, a huge component of moral development. Uh, you, you see an elements of empathy arising as er in infancy as uh, very early when newborns cry when others cry. They just, they do. It's very, um, it's very cute. You go to your baby. <laughs> it's so cruel, but you go to your baby and you, <laughs> like just to your baby and your baby. <laughs> They start crying. <laughs> and then you go, Mom, your turn. <laughs> Take it out. All right. Um, some people believe that there are stages of the development of empathy. Um, feel free to go for it. I, I, other than this part of this chapter in this book, I've never heard of the development of empathy before. But it's not to say it's not important. It's just to say I've never heard it in other contexts. All right, this is this is a good slide. I like this. I took a quote straight out of the straight out of the textbook. Of course, the reason that most of us are interested in moral development is our concern with moral behavior. Did I tell you I'm a behaviorist? Yeah, B.F. Skinner, dude, he's my pedigree. Yeah, someday I'll show you my pedigree. All right, I am a strict behaviorist. So we're interested in moral behavior or the degree to which a person acts in accordance with moral rules when actually faced with a situation that requires a choice. When our kids get in trouble, the principal tends to address what the kid did, not their thinking about it. Um, attitudes can directly lead to behaviors in certain situations. In the social psych class, I, will, I talk very much about um, how attitudes can lead to behaviors. That's a major part. Uh, well, in fact, in social psych, I, refer, I talk about attitudes lead to behaviors, and behaviors lead to attitudes, and, and the cycle begins. Okay. But it's the moral behavior that really, really counts. We as a society are caring about. And so we're going to talk about a series of moral behaviors in 
or lack of in this case, in, in uh, we'll start with aggression. Aggression is a behavior intended to harm people or property. Okay? We can refer to instrumental aggression, which is um, some aggression which is done to gain something. Hostile aggression, which is an aggression just to harm somebody. And relational aggression attempts to harm social relationships or self-esteem. So hostile aggression is usually physical harm. Relational aggression is usually psychological harm. All children, so show, all children show aggression in some form at some time, okay? And it varies by age and gender. And boys are more aggressive than girls. Not terribly much true. Uh, when it comes to over, this is like physical aggression. Boys are much more aggressive than girls. But when it comes to relational aggression, Oh yeah, girls are little bitches. You see it right there, okay? So when it comes to all forms of aggression, boys are slightly more aggressive than girls. But when it gets to something like relational aggression, girls, whoo, lower those girls or something else. Aggressiveness is relatively stable. Um, this is a very interesting thing. Um, again, this goes. This is sort of off to the side, as as I often am. Um, it, but it turns out that uh, aggressive children are the ones that go to jail later on. Um, it, it's like this. It's, it's um, you know, so if somebody commits a crime and they go to jail and they get out of jail and they go, oh, I served my time, dude. Why are you hassling me, dude? I served my time. Because if you want to predict who's going to be aggressive in the future, you look to the past. Those people that were aggressive in the past are by far, by far, by far the ones that are more likely to be aggressive in the future. So it's like, I served my time, how come you're hassling me, man? Because guess what? If I had to make a guess about who's going to be aggressive, it's whoever was in the past. If you did it in the past, my strongest suspicion is you're going to be the one that's going to do it in the future. Okay? So um, there seems to be a genetic predisposition towards aggressive behavior. Um, obviously, children learn it in the home as well. Uh, we could talk about a proactive aggressor, and they believe that aggression is just a cheap way to get what they want. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the intelligence chapter, uh, and I think I said, I, I believe I said something of this nature. Um, smart people and dumb people all want a flat screen TV. They all want a giant screen TV. Rich people have the ability to get a good job, to get the resources, to get the money, to buy the TV. Some people don't have that, but they still want it. So how are you going to do it? And I know, that's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. It's a way to get what you want. Okay? You still want it. Um, children, here, this, this is an interesting graph. This is, uh, they're, they're basically the same graph. This graph is the mean number of criminal convictions, and this is the mean seriousness of the criminal acts that are occurring. So we find they take kids that are eight years old, boys and girls separately, and they, they lump them up at eight years old into an, a, a, an aggression group. I'm sure somebody went to the school and followed them around and stuff. And, um, you know, some kids, some boys went into the high aggression group, some went into the medium aggression group, some went into the low. Some of the girls went into these three different groups, okay? And then what they did was um, they, they followed up on them and they found out, those boys that were rated as highly aggressive at age eight had an average of almost one criminal conviction by the time they were age 30. They committed far more crimes than the eight-year-olds that did all especially for, true for the women. When it comes to how serious those crimes were, look at that. If they were rated as low aggressive when they were eight years old, the seriousness is quite low. And so it, it just it's a stable trait. At eight years old, Going into adulthood, they commit the crimes. The kids that are aggressive at eight are the ones that commit crimes when they're older. I did not say cause, I said correlation. Be careful. Um, I, I have a big, here I am on aggression. I'm going to, again, here's a side note. I have a few um, things I'm very passionate about, and here's one of them, okay? Um, there are certain, see, here's the deal with aggressiveness. Aggressiveness runs in families. And the crazy thing is, is it's a twofold factor. It runs in families because, A, there is a humongous genetic component. 
And number two, because aggressive parents demonstrate aggressive behaviors to their children and reward aggressive behaviors in different ways. Um, but it turns out that this this is huge. I mean, number one, I, I, I'm going to pull out my um, my uh, uh, evolution again, just briefly. You take two men and you put them on a deserted island with one woman. Who gets the girl? Duh. Who's ever bigger, right? Whoever's bigger gets the girl. And so we find that um, who's ever stronger is beat up. The, and that's how it works, okay? There has been a strong, strong push for um, selecting aggressiveness in human beings throughout our evolutionary history. We as humans, on the other hand, have taken this one step further beyond natural selection into this realm of artificial selection. Okay? First, I'll talk about a simple one. Yeah, uh, up in Russia, there was these uh, people that were researching foxes. Fox, uh, I don't know, is foxes? I guess that would be the plural. And um, they didn't have enough money, and they needed money to fund the research. And so what they did was they decided they were going to breed fox, breed the foxes to be pets. Okay. So what they did was they took these foxes. By the way, a, a wild fox, if you put them in a cage and you approach them, they'll back up. And if you if you really push them into a corner and start approaching, they will bite. But I mean, they're mostly timid with aggression built in. Now, what they did was they found that some foxes were a little bit less aggressive than others, and so they bred those that were the least aggressive. And they did it for 20 years. And after 20 years, they bred a a, a breed. I guess they created a breed of fox that is just you, you come into the room and. <laughs> Just like a stupid dog, they'll come up and lick your face and play with you, and and it, all it took was 20 years of selective breeding to breed out all of this aggression in these foxes. On the other side of the spectrum, some stupid people, I think they were in England, Brits, they had this wonderful plan. For fun, let's just dig a pit in the ground, let's take some English bulldogs, let's throw them into the pit and see them kill each other and whichever dog kills the other the more aggressive one is allowed to have babies and the one that dies is dead and so they did this all right and literally they selectively bred for aggression and they've generated this thing that's called a pit bull now i know at least one of you is gonna be like oh but they never knew no these little bastards were never intended to be anybody's family pet. They were bred for one purpose, and that was to kill another dog. That's it. That's why they exist. That is their purpose for existence, and they were selectively bred to do that job incredibly well. Okay? Everybody's going to say, oh, I know, but it's the home environment. It's like, yes. Okay? You put a pit bull into a bad house, it's going to be even worse. But even in the most loving home in the world, a pit bull is a killer. That's all they are. They're, they're, you cannot de I cannot deny the fact that I'm a boy. Okay? Remember we talked about uh, Roger, David Reimer. All right? You can throw little dresses on that kid, but the dude is like, dude, I'm not a girl. Okay? You cannot deny certain things, and you cannot deny what these pit bulls have. It is so deeply bred into them. Every single news article that we read, everyone that we read about pit bull violence always starts with this phrase. But she was such a gentle dog. Until she wasn't, okay? And yes, the problem is these bad dogs are so often picked up by worse owners, okay? Thus exacerbating a bad problem to begin with, okay? Um, and I mean... We had um, uh, uh, our departmental secretary a, a while back, and her grandson was just sitting on his own front porch steps, just playing with some trucks, just playing away, and some neighborhood pit bull just walked up, grabbed this little kid, two-year-old in the head, just latched on and just ripped his face off. The kid was playing with his trucks. He was just sitting on the steps. What the hell did this kid do to get his face ripped off? Okay? These things just have no business in my neighborhood. Hey, and I know that I said it earlier. Earlier when I said fast cars are cool, and then I said, no, now you're a parent. They're stupid. Okay? You become a parent, and you tell me that's a good idea. 
All right? Just think about it. Okay, whatever. Now I have to get off my moral high horse, but I firmly believe that. Okay. Um, as we said, of course, part of aggression is, um, is learned. There's a huge learned component. And we had referred to Bandura earlier in quite a bit of detail. Um, and so children learn, not only do children get rewarded or punished for aggression. In fact, here's another one I have. Um, uh, I remember when I was in high school, um, one of my friends, he, uh, he got his girlfriend pregnant when they were about 11th grade, something. Uh, they had their kid early. I mean, you know, compared to anybody else. Uh, they had their kid. He dropped out of high school. He got a job. You know, he was... He was, he, it was a good job for him at that point, I'm sure. Well, whatever, I'll let that go. But, you know, it was... it was, And so, among my group of friends, he was the only one that had an apartment. Okay? So we would go to his apartment. And all of us would hang out at his place because he was the only one that had it. And so we would go there, and uh, this friend of mine, he really, really, really liked um, wrestling. He liked to watch wrestling on television. WWF wrestling. And so... His kid, his kid was about two years old, and I can still remember this kid. He, um, he used to just love to spend time with Dad, sitting on the couch watching wrestling, and Dad was thrilled with that. Hell yeah! I mean, love my boy. I'm gonna. So this kid would watch wrestling, and I remember this very specifically. The day this kid comes into the room, he wasn't getting the attention because there was a whole room full of people, and so he wasn't getting dad time. He wanted to get that back, all right? And I understand that. And so he comes in with this teddy bear, and he's got it in a headlock, and he's <clears throat> he's just pounding it in the head, and boom, and he drops down on it, and oh my God, his dad was so yes. Son, that is so great. Oh, my gosh. That is so awesome. So he sat there and he got positive um, emotions from his dad with this aggression. He saw reward on television very clearly. The more aggressive wrestlers, you know, are victorious. He got rewarded for his own aggressive behaviors. I mean, it was just nuts. You know what happened when that kid went to kindergarten? His teachers are like, no, mm -mm, no. Get him out of my classroom. This kid was in many ways doomed at two years old. His entire education is shot out the window. Teachers don't want that in their classroom, and I don't blame them. If I have a five-year-old that start body slamming other kids in my classroom, I'm going to be like, get this kid out of here, okay? That kid's education is going to suffer greatly as a result. At two years old, that kid's future, that kid's future was almost doomed, okay? So environment is huge, too. Bullying. Now, bullying has picked on, uh, picked on, <laughs> as a Freudian stuff. Bullying has definitely become a hot topic in the news in recent, uh, recent years, in particular because of um, Columbine, which was the original. Um, some of you are actually young enough that uh, Columbine is something that has existed as long as you've been around, okay? To me, it's a relatively new occurrence. Um, we didn't focus on bullying when I was a kid. I mean, Bullying happened all over the but nobody gives a shit about bullying. Nowadays, um, bullying is huge. And um, if a kid gets labeled a bully nowadays, it's over. Okay, I was at Sunday school working a couple weeks back, and um, these two boys kind of got into it a little bit. And uh, one boy was, uh, in fact, one boy was older and one boy was younger. But the younger boy was actually very, very large for his age, and the older boy was actually very, very small for his age. And so they got into this, and I mean, I broke it apart, and this bigger kid is like, but he's older than me. And I'm like, okay, look at you. You're almost twice the size of him, okay? I warned him. I took him aside, and I told him, you, because you are a bigger boy, you need to be super careful because... If you do the exact same behavior as a smaller kid, it's the exact same thing. You are going to get the label bully. The smaller kid won't. You will, even though it's the exact same behavior. So I took him aside and kind of tried to explain to him. I think I passed the message along and explained to him that 
If he's not careful, he's going to get this label, and that is going to be a bad, bad thing for him. And I, and I, I mean, he did. Oh, it's unfair. And I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. It's not fair. I didn't say it was fair. I'm saying to you that if you're a big boy, the exact same behavior will get you the label bully that a it would not get to another kid. So it's definitely something that is now. Being, you know, zero tolerance for bullying, zero tolerance for anything of this nature. Okay, they can. Uh, we could refer to direct bullying or indirect bullying. Direct bullying would be, um, you know, pushing, stealing lunch money. But indirect bullying, um, we saw somewhat recently in the news with the university student that videotaped his roommate having gay sex and put it up on the internet. That was bullying. But it was indirect. 30% uh, uh, of U.S. students have been bullied. 30% oh, of U.S. students have bullied, been a victim, or both. Boys bully boys and girls, while girls bully girls. And it's most frequent from grades 6 to 8. Okay, I can... As a general rule, bullies are more aggressive than non-bullies. They believe that aggression is a way to get what you want. As a general rule, children that are bullies are not good at perspective taking. As we said, moral behavior makes no sense. Moral thinking, moral reasoning makes no sense unless you can take the perspective of another. Bullies tend to be impulsive and more tolerant of aggression. Not a surprise, impulsive, uh, remember, uh, failing to regulate your, your, your first desire. Uh, sometimes a product of the home environment they grow up in. Um, bullies have higher levels, uh, more likely to have conduct problems and have other problems. Not a surprise. Conduct problems is a general category. Um, this is one that bothers me. I know, here I am, I'm bothered by about five things today. Um, when I was a kid, I know, <laughs> when I, whenever it starts with when I was a kid, you know it's going to be bad. When I was a boy, there was kids that were naughty. You send them to the principal's office. The principal smacks them in the ass and sends them back to class. But then the DSM came up with some of these categories. This conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. And all of a sudden, and I mean, I think William wrote a paper about this at one point. And all of a sudden, it's like... You know, that kid, he's naughty, but it's not his fault because he's got a disorder. He's a disorder. He's got a disorder. He can't help himself that he's a little shithead. It's not his fault that he smacked the teacher in the face. He's got a disorder. Oh, God. Okay. And it, it troubles me immensely that they would put the word disorder to this. Um... I would argue, again, I'm, i I got to be careful because the moment I do, my own children will start to misbehave. I would argue that it is the oppositional defiant disorder is the result of bad parenting. i got to be careful, though. I'm sure that there is clearly some, um, there is a genetic component to this, I'm sure, but I think that the home environment is by far more important. Um, Delinquent activity is common during adolescence, especially for boys. Um, remember um, James Dean, rebel without a cause, right? This toughy motorcycle. Uh, many, many adolescents show adolescent limited delinquency, a pattern of delinquent behavior that begins during adolescence and does not continue into adulthood. Very commonly, this would be caused by peer pressure. You know, you want to fit in, you got to, etc. However, sometimes the aggression and delinquency uh, continues and we call the life course persistent pattern. If it persists, it's probably not peer pressure. Okay? May result from a difficult temperament, subtle cognitive deficits, poor impulse control, poor parenting. Wow, in other words, here's a whole laundry list of things that might create it. Adolescents that are aggressive and unpopular with non-aggressive peers will find friends just like themselves. It's amazing. <laughs> Birds of a feather flock together. Yeah, they do. Okay. Deviance training occurs when aggressive adolescents find each other and form groups that encourage further aggression. 
Um, there's some interesting stuff about this in social psychology, but I mean, they've done all kinds of studies. You take a group of people that are prejudiced, and you throw them together and you have them talk about prejudice, and they walk out and they're even more prejudiced than they were when they walked in. You know, that's just, that's how it works, okay? People gravitate in this way. And so what happens is you get a group of boys that are aggressive and have bad attitudes, and you hang out together, and they become even more aggressive and have even worse attitudes, okay? That's what happens. That's social psych 101. A gang is an enduring group of peers who are involved in deviant behaviors and identified by name and common symbols such as tattoos, colors, or hand signs. Um, clearly, gang activity is associated with violence and crimes. Uh, most gang members are males, um, though uh, gang activity has been spreading even to small towns in America. Why do kids get involved in gangs? Uh, coercion is the most obvious thing, right? Um, fear of negative consequences if you refuse, that's basically a form of coercion. Uh, but the most common reason is, is uh, children join gangs to, to gain social acceptance or friendship. As I said, kids that are aggressive and violent tend to be unpopular at school, so they, they find a group of people like themselves that do in fact reward and appreciate that aggressive and violent behavior. Um, sometimes they get involved because other family members are involved or perhaps they feel that they need to be protected in some way and so they join a gang as a form of protection. Um, clearly long-term involvement is associated with antisocial behavior, psych distress, violence, injury, school dropout, early parenthood. Um, these should not surprise anybody. What about other uh, risky behaviors? Okay, um, This is an interesting thing. We said earlier, I'm going to remind you, um, the last part of the brain to finish cooking is the frontal lobes. Remember the frontal lobes? And uh, they don't myelinate until the kid's like 21 or something. We said that's nature's way of um, allowing a child to specialize, to, to sort of um, specialize into an occupation and then hardwire it in once the kid's 21 and has, has chosen their job or something like that. And it's a way to ensure that we can, we can specialize, which is huge, by the way, to specialize our skills. But what this implies is that adolescents, um, if you recall again, the frontal lobes are, are the most important critical component for impulse control, all forms of impulse control. And so we find that uh, when adolescents are faced with risky behaviors, almost all of these risky choice uh, decisions that they're going to make involve, if I do this, it'll feel good at the moment. If I do this, it'll be better for me in the long run, but it won't feel good right now. This one feels good at the moment. Boy, it's going to suck later. This one doesn't feel so good at the moment, but it's better for me later. Which one seems to be, all right. And so we find that because of the... Uh, immaturity of the frontal lobes that these children are being asked to make these hard choices at a time when their brain isn't ready to make them. Substance use refers to ingesting any legal or illegal substance that alters psychological functioning on more than a few occasions. Okay? Abuse refers to the use of substance that it creates difficulties in day-to-day -day life. Um, Two-thirds of uh, high school ninth grade students had tried alcohol, one half had tried tobacco, one third had tried marijuana. Many admitted that they tried before the age of 13. Other drugs, however, have been much lower. Uh, here is perhaps, you know, in the last 30 days or ever, and uh, looking at the ever anyway, uh, most high school kids have, in fact, by the alcohol and tobacco, with these others being less common. Uh, there's ethnic differences in who does what, not a surprise, because uh, different neighborhoods provide different stuff. Uh, another issue is binge drinking. Yeah, we know about binge drinking, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Smoking. Uh, this is interesting. Now the advertising towards children. Um, again, this this is probably ancient news to you all. But back when I was in college, there was a big stink about Joe Camel, the uh, 
mascot, dare I say, the mascot for Camel Cigarettes, and the argument that it was um, promoting smoking towards younger children, and uh, maybe you don't remember, but I mean, for a while, uh, Joe Camel was everywhere. He was on t-shirts. I had a Joe Camel t-shirt. He was, you know, everywhere, bulletin boards, hats, whatever. They put Joe Camel on everything. Like you see Mickey Mouse everywhere, Joe Camel was everywhere. All right? But the high cost of cigarettes in particular in the, in the uh, about five years ago or something, the cost of cigarettes jumped immensely. And there's been a lot of law, a lot of places. In fact, um, New Zealand has got a a graduated taxation program in place that is going to raise the price of cigarettes up to $50 a pack in the next 20 years. Are they, they're adding like a buck and a half a year or something. Oh my God. Well, at some point, um, the cost does in fact exceed the cool factor. Um, they have also, by the way, been... Oh, is it... Do you guys have a class in here? Oh, at 8 o'clock? Yes. All right. It's all right. I was just recording a video. All right. I guess I'm going to have to pause this one, and I'm going to have to come back, huh?